Wilkie, America's best-known private citizen, arrives in England. He has come to study wartime conditions. At number 10 Downing Street, Mr. Wilkie starts at the top, seeing Winston Churchill, Britain's Prime Minister, the best source of information in the entire empire. A raid alarm has sounded, and Mr. Wilkie, supplied with a helmet by his friends, joins everyday Londoners in bomb shelters and talks things over with them. I'd very much like to go with you, sir. Fine. But you're right. going to stay here till this is I've over, and we're going to gonna help you put it over. Right. I have been through four or five shelters. I've seen probably several thousand people. I haven't seen one that was afraid. Here, yeah, yeah. here. Nobody can beat a nation with such a spirit. Here, yeah, here, yeah. here, yeah, yeah. here. Bombers of the Royal Air Force drone toward Tobruk in Libya to clear Italian outposts for the attacking Imperial Army of the Nile. Smoke rises from Tobruk and gunfire is intensified. Australian infantry and tanks move up, eager to end the earth-rocking 36-hour assault that follows a two-week siege. Strong motorized units move in, and Tobruk falls to the British. Australian Division Commander Robertson takes an Italian Rear Admiral prisoner, and many of the besieged fascists are glad it's over. The British round up 20,000 Italian troops and take command of great stores of supplies in this climax of their successful African campaign. This is the city of Sliema on the island of Malta, Britain's strategic Mediterranean naval base. Its people and those of nearby Valletta aren't worried by air raid sirens until things get hot. Then they go to the shelters while the anti-aircraft goes into action. A German dive bomber swoops down too close for comfort. Malta has taken quite a beating. In fact, this is its 234th air raid since the war began. The wreckage along Valletta High Street and the strained faces suggest similar scenes in London. The Royal Navy is out for the kill as HMS Rodney seeks Germany's Bismarck. At the Rodney side moves the King George both bound to avenge the hood. The Bismarck sighted, and great shells start moving to their guns. Miles away, the Bismarck is framed in 16-inch shell bursts. Torpedoes launched from planes, the Nazi Navy's pride is powerless. She awaits the end. When it's all over, the Bismarck's few survivors are brought to a British port. The cruiser Norfolk sighted the Bismarck before her battle with the Hood, followed the German ship like a bloodhound, and was in at the kill. An American liner docks at Hamilton, Bermuda with two passengers who would draw a crowd anywhere. The first of these is Romania's former King Carol, who left his country under a hail of bullets. Next come dogs who have fled with their royal master. And now, Madame Lupescu, the king's fellow exile, whose slimness amazed and pleased an interested group of Bermudians and tourists. Carol's party will stop at the Belmont Manor Hotel in Hamilton. It is expected that they will shortly complete arrangements for a trip to Cuba, where they hope to take permanent refuge. The president delivers his most momentous fireside chat before representatives of all the Americas and U.S. cabinet members. He proclaims an unlimited national emergency, a step which legally he may take only when he believes war imminent. 
The first and fundamental fact is that what started as a European war has developed as the Nazis always intended it should develop into a war for world domination. Therefore, with profound consciousness of my responsibilities to my countrymen and to my country's cause, I have tonight issued a proclamation that an unlimited national emergency exists and requires the strengthening of our defense to the extreme limit of our national power and authority. Striking workers at Inglewood, California's North American Aviation Plant start defense labor's most critical incident. Recognizing that the police cannot control the situation, President Roosevelt orders the United States Army to take over the plant. And Uncle Sam's can-do regiment, the 15th Regular Infantry, is hurried to North America. With the arrival of these troops, whose unit did 28 years duty in China, peace is restored once more. Casualties are slight. A few strikers arrested, and three who were too slow, pricked by bayonets. With the army in charge, the plant reopens and North Americans thousands of workers pour back. There is more than a suspicion in labor circles that this strike was inspired by local leaders anxious to follow the communist party line. Now everything's peaceful with work in full swing. As North American resumes manufacture of military aircraft, more than one-fifth of total U.S. plane production. The worst blaze in Jersey City's history lays waste to eight square blocks along New Jersey's most crowded waterfront. One of the greatest firefighting forces ever assembled fought the flames. Despite the wide extent of the disaster, it involved no deaths and few injuries. Authorities do not suspect sabotage since no defense materials were involved. Losses are estimated at $25 million. Soldiers of the Army's 501st Parachute Battalion marched to their planes at Fort Benning, Georgia. These men have had their preliminary work. Well, this is the big moment. One, two, three, jump. Here goes another batch. No time to stop and think. And now a whole outfit, men, rifles, light mortars, and machine guns, all in the air at once. It takes skill to steer the chutes into a landing, and the whole job requires split-second timing and iron nerves. An easy landing like this is the exception, not the rule as these fighting men of Uncle Sam's Sky Infantry go into action, charter members of the Parachute Battalion. <laughs> <laughs> 